I would like to begin with a blessing of the Torah portion. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'alam asher kedeshanu b'mitzvatav v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with your commandments and with Yeshua, our Messiah, and has given us Torah to study. In your son's name I pray, amen. All right. So this week's Torah portion, we begin in Genesis chapter 37 through 40. And part of my journey in wanting to go through the Torah every year has been just as a growing process for me. The way that our brother Judah, the tribe of Judah, breaks it up is they break up the Torah so they can go into through the Torah in a one-year cycle. A lot of you guys maybe do the three-year cycle, but for our brother Judah, for me personally, I do the one-year cycle. It's personal preference. But the point is, you should be in the Word of God as much as possible. And... Part of my journey to kind of give me accountability in studying Torah has been to go through the Torah portions. And I've been just greatly blessed by it. Now this week, our, week, our Torah portion for this week is, in my journey through Torah, it's been a blessing because I've been going through the weekly Torah portions. The Torah portions, as you guys know, are three chapters through the Torah every week. And as you get on the Torah portions, it's like a way to get connected to God, right? Whatever God is working with the whole community of Israel in the world, not just the Jewish people, but also those of us who seek to follow the God of Torah, right? The Messiah, Yeshua, who fulfilled the Torah, right? Whatever that is for you, Getting on God's calendar is so important where you can start to study and make the Torah a part of your daily life. We don't just read the Torah. We're also supposed to consider Torah like living water. The Torah is the words of God, so that means it's a living, breathing document. It's a living, breathing, it's the words of God himself that revitalizes us. And this week's Torah portion is Vayesha. It goes Genesis 37 through Genesis 40. And what I want to do is I want to draw out three nuggets from this week's Torah portion. Kind of give you an idea of how I personally study. And maybe some of the things I draw out can bless you. I want to give words of encouragement. I also want to find Messiah in the Torah portion. I don't study Torah and none of us should study the Torah. None of us should study the Word of God as an academic exercise. That's really why we study Torah. We study it to gain insight of, into what the Father's heart is. Um, it's Torah is like into water. The Holy Spirit's like into water. And Messiah's like into water. And those three things water our lives. So when you're in the Torah portion every week, you're studying the Torah portion. The Father's making himself known to you in his own way, and you draw from the Torah portion what he wants you to know, and it helps you grow as a believer. So this week's Torah portion begins in Genesis 37, verse 1. Jacob was settling in the land where his father had sojourned, but Eretz Canaan. So, we get Vayashev from the first word that you see in red. And Vayashev basically means that Jacob settled. Words in the Hebrew, they have meaning. And there's different layers of meaning. Like on the surface, it can mean he settled, Vayashev. But then you take apart the words and you ask yourself, what do these words mean? Like Vayashev can also mean to sit, right? And... He, what is he doing? He's settling in the land where his father had sojourned. What, what does it mean to sojourn? And you see these two things going on right now. First of all, his father sojourned in this land, and he's settling. So if we move to the next slide, I want to look at that real quick. So here's the difference. 
Vayashev, he was settling, comes from the primitive root, means he settled. Compare that to Gur, which means to sojourn. When I settle, Vayashev, what I am doing, Yashav, is I'm settling up, I'm setting up a permanent residence. When I'm Gur, I look at myself as merely passing through. This place isn't exactly my home yet. It's like the picture of the nomads. Nomads, they move around. So if I'm doing Vayashev, I'm building a house. I'm living in that house. That's a brick and mortar house. But if I am doing Gur, what I am doing is I'm living in a tent. I'm more sensitive to where God directs me. I'm more sensitive to the move of the Spirit in my life. The command of the patriarchs was not to settle, not to shev, not to yeshav. Vayashev Yaakov Ba'eretz, right? He settled in the land. But to Isaac and Abraham, the command was, Gur Ba'aretz Chazot, settled, but don't settle. Sojourn in this land. And right now I'm giving you the very surface. But the deeper meaning is this. When you look at the rest of the Torah portion, you'll see Joseph settling in to Egypt. You'll see him taken away from his father, settling into Egypt and combating the different temptations, combating the different hard life circumstances. You'll see, even with the life of Judah, what he goes through. And the point is, if you are a righteous person, that means if you're a child of God, nothing's guaranteed. Let me repeat that. If you're a child of God, nothing is guaranteed. What that means is that while I am sojourning, I realize that I am not here forever. Amen. We are born against our will. We die against our will. And if I am here on earth, it is because God's will, not my own will, is the reason why I'm here. Amen. Every person walking around in this world has a reason to be here. Every person in this room has a reason to be here. We're all here for a reason. We woke up for a reason. When God created Adam, he breathed into Adam a breath of life. I breathed into him a neshama. You have a nefesh, which is your animal soul, but you also have in the Hebrew a neshama that God gave you. That is a part of your soul that always seeks godliness. A lot of times we walk around with the sense of, I want something out of life. I want whatever the world has to offer to me. And what is going on right now is that Neshama has a mission and it's using these different situations like relationships, my workplace, that seem physical and mundane. But the Neshama, the soul that wants to do godliness, sees those as mission fields. A lot of us get tripped up because we tend to pervert what God designs for us and turn that into a pursuit of the physical world. We get caught up. Instead of looking at ourselves as one day having to face the king and give an account and say, God, did I serve you with my life? A lot of us get caught up in the now because none of us knows the day when we'll pass on. None of us knows that day. So to now it looks like I'm going to live and I'm going to wake up tomorrow, and I'm going to wake up the day after, and I'm going to wake up in the morning a year from now. But nothing's guaranteed. And my time here is not permanent. Amen. When I look at that, and I look at the breath in my lungs as a gift from God, I realize that I have a mission on earth. That I move where God tells me to move. I go where God tells me to go. But if I am looking as myself as a permanent resident in this world, then what is going to happen is I'm going to get caught up in the physical nature of the world. I'm going to get caught up in what I want out of life. What's going on with Jacob's story? Why does he want to settle? Look at his life. He had to take the birthright from Esau. He also had to take the priestly birthright. So not just the blessing, but the priestly birthright because Esau was not worthy of it. That whole birthright exchange over the pot of lentils was over the priesthood of the family because the firstborn in the family is the family priest. The firstborn before the Levitical priesthood order 
was the family priest. And Esau was not worthy to be the family priest. Their family would have desecrated God's name with Esau as the family priest. So Jacob, that's why he purchased the birthright and he gave Esau lentils for it. When Jacob goes to Laban, he faces 20 years of hardship. He wants to have Rachel as his wife, but he's cheated the whole time. He comes back in Genesis, the next chapter, and he has to wrestle with an angel. He has to confront Esau. He has to watch his daughter attacked. He has to watch a lot of things go down. He has to watch his beloved Rachel die. And his life is difficult. So when we come to Genesis chapter 37, it seems natural that he'd want to settle. Seems natural that he would want it easy. So that's the temptation for him. Here's the heart of it. Many of us right now, few of us can say that our life has been easy. The closer we try to walk with God, the harder our life gets. The reason for that is because when you decide that you are going to follow the call that God has for your life, he puts you into the refining furnace. He says, all right, here's someone who's ready to listen. I know how beautiful you will be when I'm done with you. Right? Your gold ore. But I know how beautiful you will be once you've been through the fire. If you're flax, I know what what beautiful garments of linen you'll make once you've been beaten by life. So the temptation, the easy way out is to want to settle. The easy way out is to want to go back to Egypt where we came from. But the hard way, but the way that we'll be more blessed is to take every day as a gift from God. Try to find God in the hard moments. One of my favorite pastors, Nathan Harmon, talks about living life interrupted. What that means is even the hard things in my life is God's teaching moments for me. So... I want to leave that for Vayashev. I want to move on. All right, so Joseph has an interesting situation happen. Joseph tells his dream. He tells two of his dreams to his brothers. He's his father's favorite son. He's thrown in the well after going to see his brothers. And his brothers hate him. A lot of us scan over the well. And this is probably one of my favorite parts of the Torah portion because there's just so much packed in this. It says, Vayahuhu, Vayashlechu, Oto Chabora. They took him and they cast him into the pit. Vachabore, the pit was empty. Vain Bomine, there was no water in there. You have a pit, he's thrown into it. You have a picture where he's thrown in, that's probably what it would look like. It's a dry well. A bore is a dry well. And if you look at the next slide, I want to show you the difference between a normal well and I want to show you the difference between. What happens when a well dries out? In the Hebrew, you can see the two words, bor and beor. If you close your eyes and you say bor and bor, they both sound the same. They're slightly different letters, but they both sound the same. But those slight letter changes that you would not perceive if you are blind or if your eyes were closed, mean a lot of difference. They make a big difference. When a pit is a bore, it's a pit or a cistern. When a pit is a bore, flowing water in it makes it become a well. If, it's, if you are just a bore, a well, let me rephrase. If you are just a bore, an empty pit, you become a well, a bore, when the water, the living water, flows through you. When the spring comes into this empty pit it goes from being an empty pit to a well on the flip side when a well a bore runs dry it's left a pit so joseph is thrown into this pit this is a pit that was once full of water but now it's empty this is a pit that once had water now it's empty Or it's a pit that will one day have water in it, but now it's empty. 
And I want to draw upon physical to show you spiritual. Because what the Bible does is it shows you physical situations and draws spiritual conclusions from them. I propose an idea to you. No pit is ever empty. No pit is ever empty. If it is a well and it has no more water, it seems like an empty pit. But no pit is ever empty. So it says they cast him into the pit. There was no water in it. And the sages, the Jewish minds of the back in the day, they knew the culture and they also knew how the desert is around Eretz Israel. They knew that once pits have the water out of them, something lives in it. Scorpions and snakes. So they said that this pit that Joseph was thrown into was a pit that had scorpions and snakes in it. So when we look at this empty pit with scorpions and snakes, we have to look at this physical idea. It's a very terrifying situation that he's thrown into, right? Imagine being thrown into a pit with scorpions and snakes. The scorpions sting, the snakes bite, right? So moving on to the next slide, I want to show you something. I want to show you the nature of these two scorpions, what they represent, these scorpions and snakes. What does it mean there were scorpions and snakes in the pit? From a Hebraic mindset, a scorpion represents coldness. A snake represents heat. That's what they believed medically in that time. If you study the medical beliefs of the Jewish people, they believed that a snake bite had hot venom and a scorpion had cold venom in its sting. So this shows you the spiritual application. And even the Torah itself gets into this when it talks about fiery serpents attacking the children of Israel in the desert for their sins, right? They were caving to lust or lust after bread. So what happened was they were bitten by snakes, fiery serpents. A scorpion in Akharav, its two middle words are kar. This letter here and this letter here, a kof and a resh, means cold. What's the point? Because when something's cold, you have a desire to serve God, right? Remember, you have that desire that's in you. If you're a child of God, you desire to serve him. But if your pit is empty, there's a scorpion in your pit, which means you are trying to pray. You're trying to study scripture. You're trying to walk out in the mitzvah. You're trying to keep Sabbath. You're trying to keep the feast days, but something's cooling down your desire to do that. You once were on fire for God, but the scorpion, the spiritual forces in your life are cooling that down, that desire to serve God. But there's also a serpent in the pit also. That nachesh inflames the other side. If there is a desire to do righteousness, there's also a desire to do evil in us. And that serpent warms up those desires to do evil. It inflames those two sides. So you have the wrong thing that should be cooled down, right? Should be frozen, is getting warmed up. And the thing that should be on fire, like a fire blazing, is cooling off. This is what happens when your well is empty. Yeshua talks about this. He says, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places. You look at the analogy of the language. Seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And it goes out and finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. That well is empty. When he came back to the well. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. So it will be with this evil generation. What is showing right there, Yeshua is saying, if the house is empty, something evil is going to live in there. If you wonder why your devotion to God, why your ability to walk out in the Torah is restrained lately, like you're waking up and you're lackluster, this is time to get into your prayer closet and ask God, what's going on in my life? What are the things robbing me of my ability to walk with you? The point is, after you've had that prayer closet encounter, it's not hopeless. 
Deuteronomy 8.15 talks about the journey of the children of Israel through the 40 years. Right? Moses is talking to the children as they're about to enter the land. He says, as you walk through the wilderness, 40 years in the desert, the cloud of glory went before you. And he took care of the fiery serpents. He took care of the scorpions and the drought where there was no water. See, he's using that language. As you walked in the desert, he himself took care of you. He gave you the ability to tread scorpions and serpents, as Psalm 91 talks about. Part of the reason you have to ask yourself how Joseph was able to descend into a pit with serpents and scorpions, you ask yourself how that happens, and he emerges unscathed from that. It's because he has someone watching out for him. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over the power of the enemy, all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke ten nineteen, promise of Yeshua HaMashiach himself. And how did they overcome Revelations twelve eleven? They overcame him, that is the evil one, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. That's the process. When you give your life to Yeshua... I'm not just saying praying the sinning prayer, right? The sinner's prayer, the Romans 12 experience. What I'm actually talking about is pouring your heart out to God and saying, God, you can have me. This is where for a lot of us who grew up in this movement, right? Our parents were Torah pursuant. And I don't say Torah observant because none of us are fully Torah observant. We're still learning how to observe Torah. But growing up in a Torah pursuant movement, Especially for us younger people. And all of us are young. But for all of us younger people growing up in this movement, the challenge is we each of us have to have this experience. We each of us have to have our burning bush experience. We each of us need to experience the well going empty. And be able to experience the deliverance in our own lives. Because mom and dad can't always feed us Torah forever. Mom and dad can't always feed us religion. They, oh, they're never going to be able to feed us a relationship with God. That has to be our own thing. So we have to overcome by having the blood of the Lamb applied to our own lives, to the doorposts of our hearts, and then daily the word of our testimony as we're walking out the Torah, which talks about Messiah and Yeshua. There are three sources of water that fill that empty well. On the last day, the climax of the festival, Yeshua stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty, come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water shall flow from his heart. Some translations say belly. When he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. So first of all, you need the Holy Spirit in your life. How does it come about? Isaiah 12, 3 says, You shall draw water joyfully. So basically that word salvation is Yeshua's name. Those of us in the movement, we know that. That's like 101 when we first came into the movement. We learned actually his name's not Jesus. It's Yeshua. It means salvation. Wow, they told me call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. That's what they were talking about. Yeshua is, Yah himself saves us. Hallelujah. So it says you have the Holy Spirit in your life. Yeshua, that's the personal walk with Yeshua, the Messiah. He is the personal law giver you have to believe in. He then sends that spirit that dwells inside of you. And then Amos 8.11 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, then I will send a famine in the land, not a famine for bread, nor a thirst for water, but the hearing of the words of the Lord. What it means is there's those three sources of water. Salvation. Spirit and Torah. These are sources of living water. They work in harmony in our lives and they water us. When we are watered, we no longer become the empty pit. I no longer live life as I used to. I don't ever want to go back to being the empty person. I never really was empty. I was living for myself or I thought I was living for myself, but I was living to my own destruction. But now I have Messiah in me. I have the word of God in me. I have the Holy Spirit and I'm a new creation. I'm no longer an empty pit, a bore. We 
It's one of the Hebrew language words that I personally believe Hebrew is the mother language of the world. Amen. And we call a person who's empty-headed a bore. Hmm. <laughs> it's very interesting, isn't it? We call someone who's empty-headed a bore. It means someone who has that empty pit. But you know what the calling is? That anyone who can accept Yeshua in their lives goes from being a bore, an empty pit, to being a bore, which is filled with the living waters of God. The difference is the Hebrew letter Aleph, and I'm going to quickly write it up. Maybe I'll write it up later. If you stick around for the Hebrew class, the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, if you know it already, is the Hebrew letter Aleph. And the Hebrew letter Aleph is a letter of redemption. That letter Aleph is what makes a bore a well instead of a pit. Represents Yeshua who brings heaven and earth together. I want to talk real quickly. What if you are praying for the Holy Spirit in your life? You're praying for Yeshua in your own life, and you're pr trying to study Torah, and it's still boring. Keep drinking. Keep drinking. Proverbs 5 verse 15 says, Shtei mayim miborecha. Drink water from your own pit. Even if you are just a pit, keep drinking Torah. Keep praying. Keep seeking Yeshua. Keep seeking the move of the Holy Spirit in the life. Keep praying for it. Keep studying His Word. Don't ever give up. That's the point of it. And it says, Venos limitoch ba'erecha. Forgive me. So, Venos limitoch ba'erecha. It means, then you will drink water out of your own well. See, first of all, the wells are dry. But if you keep demonstrating your faith in God, then He will transform your life. Believe me. Amen. Because I was talking about this a few weeks ago. We as believers, we have a concept of what faith is. But really true biblical faith is when I believe in God, my life changes. When I claim to follow God, I don't stay the same person, but I become a new creation. That's right. There's fruit that you bear when you follow Messiah. There's new fruit that's born. Abraham, he has faith, and he hears God, and he believes God, but at the same time, the Hebrew word emunah is related to amnot, which means pillars, and amnon, which is an architect. So what that is showing me is that I'm letting God be the architect of my life through my faith in God. My life is changing. He's directing my life. He's drawing up the building plans for my house, which is the body I live in. How it functions. How it lives life. He's the architect. And what's more is his Torah is the pillars that support me. It holds me up. So if your life seems dry, keep drinking the water. Keep drinking the water. It may seem like a little trickle at first, but soon it will flow. And that's the promise to you. I want to talk about these two characters, cupbearer and the baker. It's very interesting. I have a lot of, I feel like with my slides, I got a lot of information up, but bear with me. It says, So after Joseph's thrown into prison, So the cupbearer and the baker, the king, they sinned. The word that you see in the Hebrew that's blue is chetato, it means sin, refers to unintentional sin. So they sin and they're thrown into the prison of the prisoners of the king. This is uh, Genesis 40, verse 1. I want to look at that word chetato, and it's very interesting. Like I said, it refers to unintentional sin. A good example to look at chetat which is sin from a biblical standpoint in its most basic form is, you could be generally aiming a gun or a bow and arrow at a target, but no matter how hard you tried, you just can't hit the side of a barn. And you miss the target. Or maybe you were aiming for the bullseye and you were half a hair off. Either way, from a biblical standpoint, you sinned. Says the Torah, you're supposed to do such and such, but maybe you didn't follow Torah to the T. The point is, it is pretty easy for any of us in this room. And all of us have our own version of this. 
You could look at the Chatat in this case that they sinned against their Lord, sinned against their Lord, going against what Joseph said in the last passage. When he was tempted, he said, how can I sin against Elohim? So you could look at it as a more serious sin involving immorality, or you could look at it as something simple in a general sense of the language where the word Chatat means a simple sin. The Jewish tradition theory will say that Chetat, in the case, um, a pebble was found in the baker's bread, one of the loaves, just a small pebble, and the king happened to chew on the bread, and you know how unpleasant it is to eat a rock in your food. And then when he was drinking his perfume wine, because the pharaohs of Egypt, they would take their baths, and then they would have like this aromatic wine after they took a bath, there was a fly in it. So the heart of it comes down to the butler who gave the glass of wine, aromatic wine, with a fly in it. What's happening here is that his sin that he committed was factors beyond his control. Because a fly flies into the glass of wine by its own volition. A pebble of bread, a pebble of rock in a piece of bread, is a little more negligent. So you can kind of see that there. There's the parallels. So what I want to do is try to find Messiah in this. And I know I sent a lot of surface levels. This is what we do when we study Torah. We start at the surface level, right? And we try to figure out the surface level. Sticking with the surface level first, we do kind of get the hint from Ecclesiastes 10.1. We're going slightly deeper. It says, dead flies make perfume stink. Meaning one little fly accounts for sin. One little fly can damage your life. One little sin pollutes the water. So that's the heart of it. These guys are in a prison. They're in a bore, a pit, literally. Joseph says later in the chapter, take me out of this pit. Speak to Pharaoh so I can be removed from my pit that I'm in. They're like in a little pit. You get in that pit and it starts out with that tiny little sin. So, they start out with this small sin. And what's the deeper meaning? Let's look at a case study of these two guys. The wine butler, his word is mashke in the Hebrew. Its primitive root is shaka. Mashke is also, it means to be a wine butler, but it also means well watered. The land of Sodom was well watered, or any other land can be well watered if it has a river flowing of living water flowing through it. So now you're starting to get the picture. Representing one who drinks from the source of living water. That's what his name represents. These guys from the beginning, they show up. You can see, even from the words that fly out of their mouth from the beginning, it shows where they're going. The baker is called an ofa. An ofa is real, is, means to bake in an oven. Comes from the same root that's connected with off, which means nose, also means anger because your nose flares up and gets red when you're angry. So you can see how one is one who drinks from the waters, one does not drink from the living waters, and he represents the opposite, which is anger. So one's representing mercy, one's representing wrath. So the chief butler, he's the one who represents mercy and water, he shows up, and he tells his dream. And his exchange with his exchange with Joseph has a word that shows up four times. Guess what that word is? Cup. Kos. How many cups are at Passover? How many cups of redemption are at Passover? Do they sell if you celebrate a Passover Seder, you drink four cups on Passover on the Passover Seder corresponds to Exodus chapter 6. I will bring you out, I will deliver you, I will redeem you, and fourth, I will take you for myself as a people. That's the promise. God does the first three to us to redeem us, but the fourth step is us making him our God. Now we are making the move to serve God. So already in his dream, he's showing where he's going. On a deeper level, he represents the people who are planted by streams of water, who have placed their trust in the one Messiah and have been redeemed out of their own personal Egypt. All right, let's look at the symbols of the guy. Babylon, so there are four. 
The four tribes symbol on Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, the four nations will be redeemed out of. There are also four cups of wrath for the nations. Those who are redeemed out of Babylon, they will be redeemed out of Babylon, and the nations they will be redeemed of will experience these four cups of wrath. And then there will be four cups of salvation for those who are redeemed in the final days. So, that's a, one way to look at it. Looking at the baker real quick. Like I said, from the moment he opens his mouth, Genesis 40 verse 16, guess what he says? Aphani, I was in my dream also. He opens up his mouth, not only does his name connote wrath, but the first words he speaks represent wrath. So that shows where he's going. I want to talk about the baker's story. He has the three baskets of bread. These three baskets represent the nations that enslave Israel, right? Babylon, Persia, and Greece. The top represents the kingdom of Rome. That's the one the birds eat out of. Those birds are an allusion to Ezekiel 39, where the nation of Gog and Magog, which will be these four nations culminating at the end of the age, will eat the, they'll be eaten by the birds of the field. Right? They'll be eaten by these birds of prey at the end, by the vultures. So that, you can see these two analogies going on. I want to connect it to Yeshua. So you have these two characters, right? And how, what they say is important, because it draws connections even to Messiah. And you have to ask yourself, because which one am I? Because you can choose to be either one. I could choose to be the baker, or I could choose to be the one who's planted by the streams of water. That's your choice. For me, I want to be the one who's planted by the streams of water. But the butler, the wine butler, he, what he says ties to what the slaves and the criminals, the two men on the cross, say to Yeshua in Luke chapter 23. Think of the parallels here. Joseph, who represents Yeshua, son of Joseph, Messiah, son of Joseph, the suffering servant, right? If you study Jewish thought, they believe in two messiahs. A suffering servant, Messiah, son of Joseph, and a conquering king, the second coming of Messiah, Messiah, son of David. Amen. Right? Trust. That's what they believe. We believe it's the same guy. His name is Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. So, you have Joseph. He represents Yeshua, the son of Joseph. Yeshua, the son of Joseph, hangs on the cross. He has two other criminals with him that deserve to be on the cross. He doesn't deserve it. Right? Then you have Joseph in this pit, this prison, with two other criminals. You're starting to see the thematic connections here. Because the thematic connections are in this text. Right? Joseph says, he says to the wine butler, he says, But think on me when it shall be well with thee. Make mention of me unto Pharaoh, for I have done nothing wrong. And notice when one criminal is hurling abuse at Messiah Yeshua, saying, save yourself and save us also. The other one says, do you not fear God? We are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, corresponding to Yeshua is the one who's innocent. This man has done nothing wrong. So you have the two guys who are just, justly deserve their punishment, one man doesn't. And then he, it isn't Joseph who turns to the wine butler. In this case, it's the thief on the cross who turns to Messiah, son of Joseph. And he says, remember me when you go into your kingdom. And Messiah says, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise, if you study Ganidan, which is, which is what it's talking about, when the whole world at the end of the messianic age comes back into redemption, we all will be in a land watered by the tree of life and the river of life of living waters that flows past that tree. And we all will see Messiah and we'll drink of those waters and we'll eat of Torah, the fruits of Torah. And he says, remember me when you go into your kingdom. And Messiah says, you will see me in paradise. And he says, today you will see me in paradise. And depending on how you look at the Greek, 
It could mean today you will see me in paradise, or today I tell you, in the future, in the messianic age, you will see me in paradise. I say that both are correct. Amen. Because Joseph has to wait how many more years till he walks free? Two more years. Messiah comes back in the fourth millennium after creation. He has to wait how many more millenniums till he brings back the kingdom? Two more millennium. So, the challenge for us in this world is, I'm going to wrap up here, but the challenge for us is to not be caught up in the physical. We all have our sins. We all have our baggage. We all have our things that we're laying down at the foot of the cross. We all have our empty pits that we created on our own. But we all are seeking to be filled up by the rivers of life. We are all keeping our eyes focused ahead to the coming of the kingdom. And my hope for you is that you too will be ready, just as I will, and we will one day see the Messiah.